Greetings superstars and welcome to vlog 9 and the title of the vlog this week is how to upset your supervisor. <laughs> uh, the more positive rendering would be how to enhance the relationship with your supervisor or how to make your supervisor happy. But there is no doubt that the supervisory relationship is complicated because it's not just about you, it's not just about your principal supervisor or your associate supervisor, there are many working parts in this relationship. And the reason why we're doing this topic this week is I've just about finished the new training package for new supervisors at Flinders University. So I'm teaching them to care for you, to listen to you, to ensure there are regular meetings, to read your written work, and basically to focus on our duty of care to you. But it seemed only fair that really I should have a matching friend for the portfolio of stuff that I've put in place for our supervisors. So today is really telling you some truths, some really tough truths about the supervisory relationship from the perspective of the supervisor. Ooh. So honesty does matter, trust matters, truth matters. But there's no doubt in supervision over a three year period, there are certain truths that we rarely tell our students. Every supervisory relationship has those Jack Nicholson moments. Now it's Jack Nicholson from A Few Good Men rather than from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but every now and again a supervisor wants to say to you, you can't handle the truth. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but there is a duty of care in our relationship. So today's vlog is the truth teller. There's going to be some uncomfortable moments in this vlog. You may recognize some of your behavior here and that's okay, that's great. This is about starting a conversation with your supervisor but also understanding your supervisor after those meetings where you say, hmm, something went wrong there. I wonder what happened. Well, today might help you understand that. <gasps> but first to the shout outs and oh yes, it's been a big week. So many people to say hello to. Belinda, say hello to wonderful Vicky. Hi Vicky. Himal, Jennifer, Michael and oh my lord I saw Catherine this week. Catherine, I have talked to her on the phone so often I get so many emails from her and she magically arrived in my office this week. So I was so thrilled to see you all and Catherine you are as amazing as I knew you would be. You are absolutely fabulous. Hope you know that. And you're a dear and very special person. Okay, so there are the shout outs. Let's get serious. Let's talk about how you can really upset your supervisor. And I'm going to start with a true story. This really happened to me and it gets me quite upset. So if the voice breaks, I apologize. But you need to hear the emotion in this story. And doctoral students can be incredibly cruel to their supervisors and I've used cruel intentionally there. I once took over the supervision of a student where the former supervisor had taken out a restraining order on that student. The student was not allowed within 500 feet of that former supervisor. There was also some legal action in place, it was all getting a bit messy. The student had five months left on their visa and as a senior academic in the field and with legal action in play, if I didn't take over that supervision then nobody could and there were certain issues in terms of duty of care from the university I was employed in at the time. So I took over the supervision. This student was two and a half years in and had produced 30,000 words. So I thought, well, this is not a complete disaster. But then I started to read the 30,000 words and it was absolute nonsense. It was drivel. So I had five months to do three years work. So I gave her three one hour meetings a day, sorry, three one hour meetings a week on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And we aim to produce between one and two chapters every single week. It was a deeply unpleasant experience. The student was upset, was crying, but she was sighing all the time. Whatever happened, she'd have a sigh. And even with those three hours of meetings that were held every single week, she would sit next to the lift 
on the floor of my office every single day at the end of the day waiting for me to leave and go on the train. So she'd be sitting there next to the lift sighing and crying and blocking me from getting onto the train. Now for this particular job I was in, I was in the United Kingdom, the train left at 4.57, there was only one train an hour that was a direct train, 4.57, 5.57, 6.57 and 7.57, they were the trains and the only way for me to get onto those trains was to leave my office and either go down the lift or go down the stairs. It was a sixth floor office and she was blocking me getting down either. So for five months this student had me trapped. I'd be trying to get onto the train, she would be crying, she would be sighing, she would be shouting at me, she would stop me getting on the train and I'd have to get on the one the hour later. Now I did get her through that thesis, she was passed with minor corrections in those five months but it required every little bit of patience in my body to not get upset, to not get aggressive, to not just say please will you let me get home from work. I never said that to her, I remained calm. And she never grasped, or perhaps she did, or maybe she just didn't care what she was doing to me. She didn't care that she was abusing me, she was really impacting on me and my life, my husband's life, my household, my family life. And guys, I'd been at work since 7 o'clock in the morning in those days and I was so shattered after seeing her at the end of these long days that I can't remember those train trips home from Morscombe to Eastbourne. I can't remember the train trips and I was so exhausted I can't remember walking from the Eastbourne train station to my house. That is how shattered I was. So maybe you can understand why the other supervisor took out that restraining order. Mm. So guys, what often happens is when supervisors are upset or they're disappointed, they don't express it outwardly, they express it inwardly, they get a bit passive, they get a bit upset, they get a bit quiet and often you feel it as a disconnection from students. When students are unhappy they send an email to half of South Australia, okay? Everybody knows they're unhappy. When supervisors are unhappy they internalise a lot of that disappointment. So don't judge your supervisors too strongly here and this is the moment where I tell you a truth that perhaps you haven't heard before and that is supervisors worry about you a lot. They're fearful for you a lot and yes supervisors are disappointed a lot. And here are the 10 ways that you can disappoint and you can upset your supervisor. Are you ready? Let's get into this. So one, here we go. The student does little or no reading so their opinion substitutes for reading, research and knowledge. These students are incredibly frustrating. So guys, bottom line, reading is the determinant of a successful PhD. If you don't like reading, you shouldn't be at university. Reading is the oxygen for a PhD. So reading is everything. But in some disciplines, perhaps more than others, opinion tends to substitute for research. So students talk rather than read and think. So personal views start to become a little bit complicated and confused with the original contribution to knowledge. So what we do in these meetings is we spend the hour or the half an hour begging our students to read. We're wanting to talk to you about the really big ideas. We're brilliant people, you're a brilliant person, we want to talk about the fabulous, crunchy, big, powerful stuff. That's what we want. And instead, the student keeps returning to their opinion, to their view. Bit of a problem. Number two, how to upset your supervisor. Students do know writing. There is nothing for us to assess or evaluate in terms of your scholarly level. Now I think this problem is a leftover from the old days of supervisory methods. They're often based on the Oxbridge tutorial if you will. So up to about the early 1990s guys, one of the models of supervision was that the student and the supervisor would talk and read and discuss for about two and a half years and then the final six months the student would write up the PhD. But as I said that 
was discredited really from about the early 1990s. And the reason it was discredited is that it's flawed on so many levels. Bottom line, we learn to write by writing. We learn to write by writing. Our writing improves by writing every single day. So the idea that, that a student could do an honours degree or do a master's degree and then read for two and a half years and then magically write at a doctoral level after those two and a half years is delusional. Also, without seeing writing, it's very hard for us as supervisors to assess your current level of expertise. Now, remember, when I'm saying writing, this is not necessarily writing chapters. Some disciplines, that's quite hard to do. This could be writing annotated bibliographies. So you've read something, you write a couple of paragraphs about it. It could be what I've often used as a discussion paper, so a point that you're teasing out and teasing through. Or it also could be, and I love these bits of crunchy work, where you've just got an ethics clearance and you start to talk about how that ethics clearance impacts on the methods of scholarship that you'll choose in the research. So all these sorts of interesting bits of writing can emerge. The key to recognise is that writing improves through writing. And it also focuses the discussion in our PhD meetings. So supervision is at its best when it is focused on key questions from the student or on a discussion paper, on some writing. The general discussions waste time and yes, they waste candidature. Three, students do not draft their writing. They present week after week after week unreferenced and unrefereed material for supervisors to read. Now look, many weeks supervisors are simply happy to read something. If you had a hard week, particularly from our part-timers, and you just want to slam an idea down, then look, you go for it. And we're absolutely cool with that. And that's great for one week or two or three. But if we every week start to see these sort of general, pretty sloppy, sloppy, pretty clumsy pieces of work put together, we start to panic. We start to worry. Because remember, the whole point of supervision is to lift your ability so we can get you to an examination standard. Remember, doctoral examination, let alone the doctoral candidature, is based on an arc. Where you finish is never ever where you start. So if students keep presenting us with the same basic level of reading and writing, we do start to worry. We are looking for a continual lift in your abilities. So please show us that. Here comes my big one, four. Students, uh, students do not embed corrections from a previous draft before they present the next draft. This is my living hell, to be honest with you. So what happens is this, guys, and think about how this feels, how you would feel if this happens to you, okay? We've just spent six hours reading a chapter or two chapters. We spent two and a half days reading an entire PhD draft. And then when I open the file and look at the next draft, I see that none of the errors or the flaws or the mistakes or the corrections that I've made, none of them have been embedded in that draft. Now, this makes me very unhappy. Uh, and what often happens, and thankfully with my wonderful students now, this very rarely happens. In the early days it happened a lot. When it used to happen, I used to become so inflamed that I would close my office door and I would do the full Malcolm Tucker at the computer screen. No one else is in the room, I'm just doing it to the computer. And, and then I would use a word like omni-shambles. And then I would have a glass of water, take a breath, and then I would read the draft again, making the same corrections. Boom. So, of course, I start to lose the will to live. This is caused by many things, I think. Perhaps it's laziness in the student. You can tell me, when you send me an email after this vlog, what, what would make a student open a document and not make the corrections made by their supervisor. Laziness, a disrespect, for the supervisor and also where I think the disrespect gets me upset is it's showing me that you have no respect for my time. Like I've spent all this time with you, I've given it to you freely and you've just gone, 
zero interest, not bothered. I mean, bother, really bother. So this is the big one, guys. If supervisors ask you to make changes, they're doing it for a reason. So respect their expertise and please respect our time. And if you don't want to use their advice, that's absolutely cool. Use the comment box in Word and explain why you are not making those corrections. I'll give you a great example my wonderful current student, Graham, uh, does on his drafts. It's fantastic. We're within six weeks, I think, of submitting that thesis for our Graham. Terribly proud of him. But at this point, it's getting crunchy. Okay, these are big corrections. This is heavy lifting that we're both doing, right? And what Graham does is when I'm making a big correction, he says, look, Tara, and this is in a box in Word, look, Tara, I've added a couple of paragraphs here. I know I need probably three or four pages, but can you just check those few paragraphs? Am I on the right track before I actually complete the full correction? As always, my wonderful students teach me, Graham's taught me, maybe he's taught you something as well. Engage with the corrections. Don't agree with them, but at least address them. Five. Oh yeah. Students do not implement a crucial deal-breaking bit of commentary about content or approach. Supervisors keep reminding you, please address this issue. Students ignore it. Supervisors say, please address this. Supervisors, students continue to ignore it. So this is a complete nightmare. So as you can see, nightmare five comes from nightmare four. Students don't make corrections, right? Now mostly, most of the corrections we offer you, they're not deal-breakers. So if you don't do it, the examiner will pick it up and you'll get a major correction, you might get restructuring, you might need more data. It's going to slow you down but it won't fail you. Unfortunately there are crucial corrections that supervisors raise every single week where it might be about the scale of the reading, so your reading is pitched too low or there's not enough reading, your bibliography is too thin, the depth of your analysis is not there, or this is a crucial one particularly in my field, the continual presentation of a scholar or an idea that has been long discredited. So these are deal-breaking corrections. If you don't address these, that's when you will fail your thesis, right? So in my field, I'll give you one example, the field I work in, if anybody mentions the phrase digital natives, then anybody who knows anything about that field goes, that person has nothing to say to me, right? So Mark Prensky was wrong when he invented the phrase digital natives in 2001. And the American Pew and Internet, the great study of Pew, the Internet and the American life through all their longitudinal studies, they discredited that for the last decade and a half. So this idea is flawed. So if a student in a PhD mentions Prensky, or mentions digital natives, then the examiner immediately goes, this person has no idea what they're talking about. So that's when I keep saying, dude, remove that reference. The examiner will pick it up and you will fail that thesis. Every discipline has these types of terms and ideas that are basic and are discredited, and if a PhD student uses it, the examiners will switch off. So these days, guys, I've learnt to be really avert with my students. So in the old days, you say, oh, look, maybe, can you remove that reference for me? It's, it's not helping you, can you remove it? And of course, it would still stay there, and the students perhaps weren't realising how serious the situation is. So these days, as an old lady, I simply say, dude, if you leave that reference in, you are going to fail this PhD. Take the reference out. Okay, so when a supervisor says something to you as overtly as that, really do, really do believe them. Remember, we are trying to protect you. We are called supervisors. Supervisors because we have supervision. This is your first PhD. We have supervised 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We've examined 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100. We've not only done our own, we have expertise in supervision. So our job is to make your single PhD a much more pleasant experience. So when we tell you a deal breaker correction, please listen and please believe us. Mm. Six, ah, students miss meetings. 
Now, most academics these days are run by their Microsoft Outlook calendar. As you can see, I do these videos very early in the morning so I'm not interrupted, and you see I haven't got my computer on yet because the moment I turn my computer on, the Microsoft calendar comes to life and starts to organize every minute of every day. So my Microsoft calendar runs my life. I am anchored to it. And by the way, it's not a very pleasant way to live, guys. But therefore, it's very tough for me to schedule supervisory meetings into my calendar. I see my students weekly, and I have scheduled those meetings from now right the way through until Christmas so that we're not interrupted. And unless HR, my boss, the DVCR, or the big boss, the vice chancellor, wants to see me, and I will immediately stop everything I'm doing and going and seeing them, but anybody else, I will respect my supervisory time and I will see my students because guys it is incredibly hard for supervisors these days to carve out time for our students we do make you the priority I promise you but the trouble is when you miss a meeting it's very hard for us to catch that meeting up, okay? It's not like the old days where you miss, and this is true, the old days this was true, 15 years ago. If you missed a meeting on the Thursday, we'd have the time to make you a cup of coffee on Friday and catch that meeting up. Guys, those days have now gone. So we understand when you have to miss a meeting, if there's a family issue or medical or all that sort of stuff, absolutely fine. But please, if you can get to the meeting, do get there and get there on time because we've probably got a meeting just before and a meeting just after. So one other thing that might help you when you're thinking about your supervisor and they're a bit agitated and they're being run by their calendar is these days, guys, academics 90% of our time is organized by other people. Okay, 90% of our time is organized by other people. We have about 10% of our time left and we give that to you freely. But please make good use of it, okay? Seven, Ooh. students stop working, they go on holiday, they procrastinate, they develop whole other interests. So the students that sort of drift away from us. This one really frightens us, guys, because we know what it takes to get a student through in three years. We really, really know how to do that, and it's tough. And we panic. We worry. When a student starts to do other things or miss meetings or not pre present written work or not do their readings, just sort of discover another life, we know that they're not going to finish that PhD and we panic, we worry for you, we fear for you. And the problem is, this sometimes may be expressed as anger and that's not right but it is understandable. Supervisors are not trying to ruin your life, I promise you, but they just want to make sure that the PhD has a place in your life and while you're doing the doctorate, it's got to be an important place. So we help you the best way that we can. But if you develop other priorities, it's very hard for us to do our job. So just remember that. Eight, the students who complain about everything. I call them the students who whinge, the whingers. We're going to the whingers, wow. This is a really difficult group to supervise because the whinging wastes so much time. So we've all had students who arrive at a meeting and instead of using this great time to talk with a scholar about high level scholarship and ideas and abstract theories and how we really generate this original contribution to knowledge and make you famous, instead of using this time fantastically, instead they use the time to whinge about the supervisors, about other students, about the university, about their partner, about their brother, about their dog. They whinge. Now, whinging wastes time. What I want you to remember, guys, is the time with your supervisor is so precious. Guys, it's so rare in life that any of us get an opportunity to spend time with a really clever person who cares for you and wants to make you even cleverer than you are. So please use that time for scholarship, not for whinging. Okay? Nine. Oh yeah, students are unpredictable, students are emotionally volatile. Now, three years is a long time. It's a lot of life, guys, and bad stuff 
happens in three years of anybody's life. Someone dies, someone gets sick, money gets tight, bad stuff happens, okay? And that's one of the reasons I focus so strongly on getting a PhD through in three years, because the longer a doctorate goes, the more likely something bad is going to happen. So if at least I can predict in three years, we can manage this time, then I know we can get the students through. But the problem we have as supervisors is when we have really unpredictable students. So the dream, and I've been incredibly lucky through my career, is we have students who are committed and focused and robust and interesting and brilliant. And by the way, that's one of the reasons when I decide to take on a student, my number one priority really is motivation. I want to know, I can teach them theory, I can teach them methods, I can teach them just about anything, that's fine, but I can't teach them to be motivated. So I need excited students coming in. So motivation matters to me because it stops this sort of aberrant behaviour. So when students are not emotionally even, then the supervision becomes quite tough. So what happens is students come into meetings and they start crying or they start shouting or they start slamming doors and then it gets very, very hard to supervise because what we need is we need you centered. We need you even so you're able to read and write the best scholarship that you can do. And if you're slamming doors and crying, you're not focusing on the high level scholarship that you need to do. Now, we all go through really bad times. I really get that. But you've got to ask yourself, how are you helping your supervisor, and indeed, how are you helping your supervisor help you if you're slamming doors in his or her face? How is that helping anybody? How is that helping your project? The best of scholarship is disciplined. So start to focus on that physical, emotional and intellectual control. And also, I suppose, try to understand it from the supervisor's perspective, guys. I know it's hard, but we have a weekly meeting with you. And if we know that you could cry or you could shout at us or you could get aggressive, we start to get nervous. And just to give you a sense of how this feels as a supervisor, I've had one of these students and I got him through, no worries at all, but for three years, whenever I used to hear his footsteps coming along the corridor to my office, my stomach would start churning and I'd feel a bit sick. I'd start to get a bit frightened and I didn't know how he would be behaving on that day. So guys, just be aware, your behaviour has incredible impact on supervisors. We got that lad through, but it was very frightening and it was very upsetting. And as I said, imagine once a week for three years, your supervisor's stomach doing that because of your behaviour. Try and avoid it if you can. All we want is the best for you. And 10, uh, students are silent and students are moody. So what happens is these students sit in meetings like they're Yoko Ono in the Let It Be sessions. So they don't speak. This group is incredibly difficult to manage, guys. In fact, they're the exact opposite of the whingers because the whingers over-emote. They tell us everything that's going on in their mind and what happens is our Yoko Ono students say nothing. So we as supervisors try to do everything we can. We probably over-talk to just try and work out how you're feeling, what's occurring, you know, let us know, what can I do to help you? And of course, they're not telling us what we can do to help you. So please use communication, engage with your supervisor, tell them, tell us, tell us what's going on and we can find ways to help you. Don't be silent. They're very hard students to supervise. So guys, think about it in your own life if you've ever done these things. Have you ever arrived at a meeting with a supervisor a bit moody or a bit aggro? Uh, have you ever produced a few weeks, maybe a few months of under-referenced work or unreferenced work, stuff that's at a pretty basic level? Are you not taking on board the important corrections that your supervisor is asking you to do? Or are you making us panic because it's clear that you're not reading and you're not writing enough each week? Have you done any of that? Doesn't matter if you have, just acknowledge it in yourself and we'll come up with strategies to address it going forward. That's the important bit. So guys, that is why some supervisors appear to emotionally withdraw from the process. When you think, I wonder what my supervisor's thinking. They're not expressing their emotion because they're just trying to main, remain solid and stable for you. Remember, I always focus on the supervisor and the student relationship as a professional relationship. Yes, it can be quite personally close, but for me, that's not really the focus when I'm training supervisors or I'm talking to you today. What I want you to remember 
is the university is a workplace and your supervisor is a worker in that workplace. So remember when you come in and you have a shout or you get cross at us, you, you know, you can leave. So you come in and this happens in this office as well as the dean. Students come in, have a shout, have a complain and then you guys can go home. <laughs> and that's great, I'm glad you've got it out, it's important you get it out, but you can go home. I stay here and I come back the next day and the next day and the next day because this is my workplace. This is my livelihood. So just remember your supervisor is also a worker in a workplace. So show them some decency and respect because you can go home. They have to come back here the next day and every day until they retire. So it is important to remember our supervisors are people. We are flesh, we are blood, we are bone. We will always be professional and caring with you. And remember, when I train supervisors, I focus on integrity and respect and kindness every single day. All we want from you, and this is the deep truth, all we want from you is that you act in your own best interests so that you read, you write, you think, you create. You become the best scholar that you can be. That's what we want for you. The key is to manage the disappointment between both parties, the supervisor and the student. And the way you do that is to keep the lines of communication open. So don't express what you're feeling with excessive emotion. Just tell us what's going on and together we can come up with a solution. That is effective supervision. Also, please always remember to listen to what your supervisor is saying to you. And when I train supervisors, I always say, listen to what your student is telling you. Because guys, listening, not talking, is the bedrock of scholarship. When we listen, we learn something. I hope this has been a useful session for you, you understand something about supervision and understand how this incredibly complicated dance between supervisor and student is constituted and reconstituted every single week and every single year until you finish. So I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope your supervisors have a wonderful week. And I'd love to hear from you. As always, send me an email. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you feel. And as always, I wish you love light and peace. Tia.